As far as preferred mediums, and you'd have to say painting, you'd say paintings or not your forte or? At the time that I started to get serious about putting my stories and my drawings together, well, I had messed with oils, I had messed with watercolors, I had messed with clay, I had done stone sculpture, in and out of everything. Right. When I focused on, okay, I'm going to be done college and I'm going to write books and I'm going to illustrate them, put my covers on. Why did I want to put my covers on? Because the cover illustration at the time did not suit my concepts. Uh. And I said, Conan the Barbarian, beautiful as Presetti is, boy, his painting is awe-inspiring. The subject matter did not fit. Right. So I said, so much depends on having the concept fit the story. I don't want my readers to be cheated. So I, I can do this. So Stupid me, you know, I can do this. You know? You're talking about the cover, the cover illustration matching the content. Cover right? illustration <laughs> required a degree of realism. Yeah. Or a degree of inspiration that was just so visceral, like Frazetta did. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really do it in pen and ink. Now, there were artists who came after who did. Thomas Canty certainly persisted with his amazing stuff. And he broke the mold, and he got it accepted. Right. So it, I figured that I'd have to toe the middle of the line. I mean, breaking in as a writer and illustrator, that's hard enough. And I found I really like the oil paints. I really do. There's something about them that works for me. Um, but I bounced around acrylics and everything else in between until I settled on that. And it just became comfortable because I liked it. There was, there was a synergy there. So I had to start out in illustration and illustrating for other people. So I had to look enough like the marketplace that I could get in, but obviously not copying somebody else. So I never got the quantity of covers that anyone who focused strictly on art would have. But I did break in as a professional painting and illustrating. Um, self-taught. Okay. So, and then as I got that, then I got the first novel. Now I began to put it together. Now I very seldom do anything for somebody else's work. It's mostly just doing what I'm trained to do. Okay, well, that's a very, very, very good point. And um, I've become illuminated and educated by that. Um, over the short time that I've been here, and talking, um, something came up. Um, we talked about um, a lot of the absence of um, um, we call it female intuition or um, a female influence in our world. I have not. You're the first female artist I've spoken to, and it seems to be there are more coming up. But you're kind of a forerunner, and in a sense, you're a forerunner for these that are coming behind you. Are there, was there any obstacle that relied, that came upon your gender as an artist, that being a female, is there something you want to say? Um, as a female artist, were there any different obstacles that you had to face? Merely because well, of they're, they're the ordinary ones that are passing hopefully quickly, uh -huh. unequal pay for the same job. Right. The people in positions who didn't respect what you were trying to do that said, you know, one, one particular art director that I went to see early on and I went in with my portfolio, I went in with my portfolio, and you never refused to see me, but I, I asked why I wouldn't you give me a job. And he said, because in five years you're going to be barefoot and pregnant. And I simply closed the door and said, don't need to go back to see him again. And another one that took a long time to get a job and found out later, he get to, waited because he thought I had a boyfriend paying the bills. Um, but I don't want to talk about those kind of obstacles because okay. I think those are leaving. I think um, gender is becoming less of an issue for people entering creative fields. If you walk in with a portfolio, sooner or later you're going to get through no matter who's silly idea you run against. You just step around it, don't let that stop you. I think what you're driving for is really the, the denigration of the feminine side of life, not just women. Imagination is not respected like science is. Mm -hmm. The concrete is not, is far more um, acceptable than the formless idea that may create something concrete. The idea of 
emotions, get them out of the boardroom, that kind of prejudice. If you experiment with your brain and you think a thought, you're going to discover, if you really listen, that thought and feeling are interconnected. A thought is going to create a feeling. And you can change the feeling by changing the thought. Mm -hmm. The thought foreruns that feeling or follows the feeling, but usually an event or an impact or thought. Now, if you disown the emotionality and you say emotions are less, they don't belong in the decision-making process, right. you have just crippled the other half of a, of a very yeah. dynamic balance. Too much emotion, too much reason. Too much reason burns the earth, too much emotion, and everything runs wild. You need that synergy. Right. So, do I find that the feminine is still suppressed? Yes. You walk into any average Western social situation and say I'm a fantasy author or a fantasy painter. Oh, you work for children, don't you? Well, these are not pow these are powerful concepts. They're not just for children. Right. If we cannot imagine a different future, we will never have the inspiration to reach for. That's correct. And we will never make concrete anything. Uh, the number of times where imaginative concepts have foreran our choices are a million. And that's it. That's what separates us from the animals in many ways, is that ability to imagine and then choose, to pursue right. or not to pursue. To imagine a future and go, this is not a road I want to take. Mm -hmm. Feeling tells you, don't take that road, right? Right. So, without the feminine side, with, you know, you don't always need the logical cure, you might need the imaginative one. Why is the imaginative one considered less? Why is emotionality considered girlish? Yeah. So this is where I think some of our greatest, most powerful reservoirs are being denigrated or not tapped or eliminated. And some people are downright frightened of them. Mm -hmm. Because maybe you were taught when you were very young, if you imagined something you couldn't have, you were told emphatically, get back in line, and it hurt so bad you never tried again. Yeah, yes. See, I was lucky there. I was allowed to do that and not get punished for it too soon. Right. So I, I was fortunate in my beginnings, extremely. This one came from your parents? If, whether they were too busy or just too, I don't know. Oh. I was just lucky. I was left to run a bit wild. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they were that kind of people that, I mean, they kind of broke their own boundaries themselves. I mean, my mm -hmm. dad was pretty remarkable. He was, he never finished college, but he did everything he wanted to do. Everything. And then some. He was, he was wonderful. You know, I fall back on his guidance all the time, and when I lost him, it was, I haven't lost him because he taught me how to live. How mm -hmm. many kids can say that about their father? Well, still, he was still there. He did it in spite of, he did it by example, he did it by just being who he was. And my mother was, not intervening enough to pretty much let things go.